Well, good morning. Could you open your Bibles with me, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 16, page 202, and the Bibles in the seat backs in front of you, and you can feel free to use your mobile devices as well. And then there's another verse we're going to be reading later on, another chapter, and that's Psalm 51. So 1 Samuel 16 will be in just a moment. That's page 202. And then Psalm 51, a little bit later, that's page 405. So you can drop your bulletin or your program into Psalm 51. But we'll get there in just a second. We're going to be kicking off a new series this week entitled Songs of Summer. And if you are a guest, this is the perfect week to be here. Because this week is going to lay the foundation for all the weeks to come. Now, I want to kick off this opening message with a question to you. And the question was, who was the coolest girl or guy in your school? Who's the person who stood out in your mind as the coolest person? Maybe they were an athlete. Maybe it was their musical ability. Maybe it was their grades. Maybe they just had great hair. I don't know what it was, but what was it about someone or who was that person that just stood out as the total package? For me, going back to high school, there's a guy who was in my class. This friend of mine, his name was Rob Shea. Now, Rob had it all. Rob and I were in a, in a music group together. Rob graduated with more than a 4.0 GPA. He actually had a full ride to Princeton. He was a state wrestling champ. He was friends with everyone. I mean, even teachers wanted to be his friend. He was that guy. He had the, the beautiful girlfriend, and he was friends with every people group. It didn't matter which lunch table he wanted to sit in. Every group wanted Rob sitting with them. He was that person. He just got it. And today we're going to start by talking about the person who was that guy in the Old Testament, the part of the Bible before Jesus came. And as a matter of fact, for me, when I, when I look at the Bible, there's Jesus and then there's this guy as far as kind of the, the shock and awe category when you look at his life and everything was about. And this person was the author of many of the Psalms that we read in the book of Psalms, which is what the series will be about. And what he didn't write, he pulled together. He's the one who chose and, and compiled the book of Psalms. His name is David. David is very demanding. And yet at the same time, he's sensitive. He's a lover, he's a musician, and he's an incredible warrior, like on the Avengers level. He goes in by himself and can wipe out villages. The more you read about David, the more amazing you see he is with a sword or in battle. He starts out as a commoner and ends up a king. Women swoon, men revere him and stand in awe. He's called a man after God's own heart, and yet he struggles with lust and pride and depression. Let's jump into his story. It starts with his dad. His dad's name was Jesse. Jesse had actually eight sons, and one day a prophet shows up. This prophet's name is Samuel. A prophet shows up and says, Jesse, one of your boys has been chosen to be king. Bring the boys in. And let's see who it is. That's where we're going to pick up reading 1 Samuel chapter 16, beginning at verse 6. It says, When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Then uh, Jesse then had Shammah pass by. And Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending sheep. Pause right here for a second. You have a prophet show up at your house and say, one of your boys is going to be king. Bring me all of your sons. And yet you leave one out. You see, David wasn't viewed in line with the other sons. He wasn't as favored. David wasn't viewed as a son actually at all. He was viewed as a servant. 
He's given the menial, the trivial tasks to go do with the servants. But look who God puts his hand on. Let's read on. It says, Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Now David was believed to be about 12 to 16 years old at this point when he's anointed king. And the king at this time, whose name was Saul, knew nothing about him. David's time hadn't come yet. He goes back out in the field and starts shepherding. But here's Saul who had been chosen to be king, but said, I'm gonna do it my way, bypass what God wanted, and God's hand comes off of him. He's full of rage, he's an angry guy. As a matter of fact, the Old Testament says in 1 Samuel 16 that there is actually an evil spirit that rises up in Saul. And one of Saul's servants comes in and says, listen, I know this guy. He's a shepherd, he's on the backside of a hill somewhere, He's fought lions and bears for his sheep, and he's an incredibly, incredible heart player. And if you're going into Saul's presence, you better know how to handle yourself because Saul has this habit of chucking spears and knives at people. And if you're strumming on a harp, you better be able to move. So David comes into Saul's presence, begins to play, and Saul begins to calm down. He begins to rest, and David gets a lot of favor from Saul. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that David becomes Saul's armor bearer, which is like saying he becomes his right-hand man. He has a lot of prestige, and it's all good until all of a sudden David starts to grow in strength in fame and in popularity. And egotistical kings don't like others stealing their spotlight. And perhaps the best known of all accounts from David's life, David takes on and defeats this colossal warrior. His name was Goliath. And no one else in the army wants to face Goliath. Nobody wants to take Goliath on, no matter how bad mouth Goliath gets. But David says, I'll do it. Takes him down, and once he does, his life is never the same. He never goes back to shepherding. He's either in the castle in the service of the king or as king, or he's on the run. Saul realizes something's wrong when even the people in his own kingdom and and in his own castle begin to prefer David over Saul. Saul's son, Jonathan, who's supposed to be the next king, realizes God's hand is on David. And then Saul's daughter, Michael, falls madly in love with David. Saul doesn't care for any of this. He gets incredibly jealous. And then let's make matters worse. The ladies in the streets, and guys, nothing puffs up a man's ego like what the ladies say. Ladies, if you didn't know that, it's true. So the ladies in the street all of a sudden start chanting, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. David's the man. Saul may be on the throne for the moment, but David is the man, and Saul wants David dead. Saul knows that Michael loves David, so he tells David, you can have the daughter of the king. You can have her hand in marriage, but David can't afford that. He's a shepherd. I can't afford the dowry for the daughter of the king. So Saul says, here's what I'm going to do for you. If you'll go out and you'll bring back to me a hundred Philistine foreskins. Now that's romantic. (laughs) Nothing says love. Forget roses. If you'll bring back a hundred Philistine foreskins, if you don't know what that is, ask your parents. If you're a grown up, ask your parents. (laughs) If you'll bring back a hundred, then you can have her hand. How many of you know that's some that's some close combat when you're coming back with foreskins? (laughs) David doesn't just come back with a hundred, he comes back with two hundred. And at that point, Saul knows he's been bettered. There's somebody more powerful than him in the kingdom. He's been outmatched. Jonathan and Michael warn David, he wants you dead. And David takes off. And for years, David is on the run. 
And he pens psalms such as Psalm 57, 59, and 142 of the honesty and the struggle he's going through. And as he's on the run, all of a sudden, different men, different groups start being drawn to him. He's a natural leader. But these aren't the most uh, scrupulous men. These are more like bands of pirates who used to raid traveling groups or raid cities. They begin to draw around David, but no matter who was around him, no matter how bad the need was, David never went to battle. He never took on a challenge without asking God first. And if God said, yes, go for it, he would go for it no matter how big the challenge looked. No matter how bad the odds were, he would listen for the command of the Lord for how to do it. And if God said, no, don't touch those people, David would leave them alone and tell his men, you don't touch them, no matter how sweet the victory could have been. David was a man after God's own heart. Saul never gives up. He's relentless in his pursuit of David. And yet David refuses to harm or even speak bad about Saul. There's an account where David walks, I'd encourage you, read 2 Samuel. All this is in there. It's, it's, it's cool stuff. David walks up on Saul. Saul's asleep. Here's a guy who wants you dead, and he's laying out for you to do whatever you want. And you know what David does? Nothing. He leaves him alone. Doesn't even touch a hair on his head. A little later on, David's hiding from Saul, and he's in a cave. And the Bible says Saul goes into that cave to relieve himself. Talk about a compromising position. And you know what David does? Nothing. David understands God has a timing. And when God's timing is right, he'll put me in the seat that he's called me to, the authority he's called me to. But until then, I'm going to respond and be responsible to the authorities in front of me. Saul dies, David becomes king. And one of David's moves is to bring back the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God. He wanted things in Israel, now known as the city of David, to be in line with God's order. And as they're bringing back this Ark of the Covenant, David starts celebrating and dancing and rejoicing, and he is out of control dancing. He's the guy you see on YouTube that ends up like the Ford on everyone's Facebook page where you're looking and going, come on, buddy. It's to the point that Michael, his wife, gets embarrassed. She's like, David, you have looked like a fool. In response to Michael in 2 Samuel chapter 6, David says, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. He's saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. I got moves you haven't seen yet. I will celebrate before God. Then he goes on to say, I'll be humiliated in my own eyes because I'm not doing this for me. This is a celebration for the presence of God. David is passionate. He's expressive. He's faithful to God. But that does not mean he's perfect. David wants to build the temple, a place for God to reside, kind of like his home address on earth. And the prophet Nathan comes on the scene and tells David, it's not gonna be you who builds this. You've shed too much blood. There's too much death at your hands. Your son can build it, but it's not gonna be you. There's one death in particular that stands out. There's a specific spring, the Bible tells us, where all the other soldiers had gone off to war, but for some reason, David stays back this time. He was not supposed to, but he does. He goes up on his rooftop, which for us would be like going out on a deck, and he's looking out over the kingdom, everything that's his. And he spots this beautiful woman taking a bath. Her name is Bathsheba. And he says, I want her. She doesn't do anything to lure him in. She's not trying to set him up. And yet David says, I want her. She has no choice. When the king asks for something, he gets it. She's brought to King David. David has sex with her. She becomes pregnant. She's married to a man named Uriah. Uriah is one of David's greatest warriors. Uriah, David has him brought back from the front. He thinks, maybe I can cover this up. So he brings Uriah back from the front, pulls Uriah aside and says, listen, Uriah, you know, you've been on the bat out in the battlefield a long time. You've been hanging out with some smelly men for a long time. 
why don't you go enjoy your wife? Uriah says, how can I enjoy anything when the battle's still going on? People are fighting for this country. My men are still fighting. I won't enjoy anything. Send me back to the front. David agrees. Send Uriah back with orders, and those orders are for the death of Uriah. He's carrying it in his own hand. The orders are send everyone in the battle, including Uriah, and when the battle gets heated, pull everyone else back and let Uriah stay in there by himself. Uriah dies. In David's mind, I'm wondering if he's thinking, I finally covered this thing up. I've got an excuse to take Bathsheba. But on the scene shows up Nathan. Nathan knows what David has done. God calls David on the carpet through Nathan. David repents and his heart broken, not just because of what he's done, but because of what it's done with the relationship between himself and God. And out of this, in this moment, he writes, he pens Psalm 51, which we're going to read in just a second. I want you to think about this. One of the most powerful men, not only in biblical history, but in the history of the world, wrote what you're about to read out of a place of brokenness after being called on the carpet. Psalm 51 and verse 1, it says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. God, I know what I did, and I can't get it off my mind. Against you and you only have I sinned. And done what is evil in your sight, so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Jump to verse 8. It says, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. God, give me some relief from this. Let me at least hear some rejoicing. Even though what's in me is so broken. Verse 9, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of, my salva of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. I'll learn from what I did and I'll help others learn as well. Verse 14, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are my God, my Savior. And my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You delight not, you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. David knows I can't bribe my way out of this. I can't pay my way out of this. If I could just give a sacrifice and be done with it and God's happy and I'm happy, that'd be great. But God, that's not what you're looking for. David says, what I bring to you, Lord, is a broken and contrite heart. I know what I've done and I am sorry. I'm repentant. He takes God's judgment and understand what has happened. And David's family from this point on is a mess. One of his sons tries to overthrow him as king, and there's something that goes on with his daughter. There's another situation with his son that I'm not going to talk about. It is a seriously R-rated movies, and there's kids in here, but I'm telling you, read 2 Samuel. It'll blow your mind how messy things got. And the Bible is not a fluffy cotton candy book. It records the reality, the highs and the lows of humanity. No matter how downcast, depressed, or despondent, we see David lift his eyes again, though, and look to his maker, look to his God, and praise him. And this reliance on God, continual pursuit of relationship with God, is part of what makes David a man after God's own heart. God made David a promise. He said, I'm going to have someone in your lineage who's going to be a king forever. He'll be known as the son of David. And generations later, Christ is born out of the lineage of David, known as the son of David. David set the stage for what Christ would become as the true and ultimate king. Now in these next nine weeks, we're going to jump into David's heart and his head. We're going to look at what he thought and how he did it. And how are we going to do that? We're going to do it by reading his journals. We're going to be reading the book of Psalms. The Hebrew title for this book is Tehillim, which means praise or hymns. 
because a leading feature in its content is praise. But it's also more than that. One person wrote, in it we see God's nature, his attributes, perfections, and works of creation, providence, and grace all unfolded. In the sublimest conceptions of the most exalted verse, God's glorious supremacy over the principalities of heaven, earth, and hell, and his holy, wise, and powerful control of all material and immaterial agencies are celebrated. David gives us the big picture of who God is. And as we look at this, I don't want us to just look at this as a history book. Like that's what God did just with David. Well, that's all true. It also relates to us today and how we can live and how we can survive and how we can respond either in the despondent times or in the times of praise and recognizing what God has done. And it can, can and should change our attitude moving forward. So here's the blanks. Here's what I'd at, like to ask us to do in this series. First of all, be ready to raise your expectations. Be ready to raise your expectations. Psalm 130 and verse five, it says, I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. Understand, God can and will move. Raise your expectation. Psalm five and verse three, it says, in the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and I wait in expectation. God is not dead and God meets with us more than on one hour on Sunday morning. Have an expectation that God can show up as you read and study his word. Psalm 102, verse 18, it says, let this be written for a future generation that a people not yet created may praise the Lord. God is not done. Raise your expectation level for a Sunday morning. Raise your expectation level for a time of worship together. This kind of sparked in me at Easter. We had our Easter services. Everything went fine. We did it the same way we do every other service, basically. We kept no new songs. We didn't do this big extravaganza, promotional, you know, dramatic anything. It was a very regular Spring Lake service, and yet people came up and said, oh, Easter was wonderful. I was like, awesome, thank you. Why? Caught some people off guard. Why? And what I came to realize is it's because of the expectation we come to Easter with. We come with our eyes on the cross and the empty tomb. We don't just come to church. We come to celebrate what God has done. Every Sunday is Easter. Every Sunday is a celebration of the cross and of the empty tomb. Come with an expectation. Come with an attitude and a readiness to worship, to celebrate. Psalm 34, Psalm 42, Psalm 71, and others. David cries out, I will worship God. My soul will rejoice in him. It's not a choice David gives himself. It's a command he gives himself. No matter what else is going on, I come with an expectation that I'm gonna worship God and I'm gonna meet with him. Don't just come to church. Come to meet with God. Raise your expectations. Secondly, be ready to be challenged. Be ready to be challenged. No piousness, no church face, church clothes, church attitude. Be real, be honest. When we read Psalms, we'll get to that in a minute, but when we read Psalms, you're gonna read the raw heart and emotion of a real person. And it's part of laying everything bare before God and saying, it's all yours, Lord. Clean up what needs to be cleaned up. That's part of what has the integrity, the honesty, and the relationship between God and David. And that's why he's called a man after God's own heart. I would love for God to be able to say Spring Lake Church is a church after God's own heart. We don't play church, we are the church. We don't play Sunday service, we come to meet with God and learn from his word, celebrate him. David talks about what it looks like to be faithful when no one else is. Rise to the challenge. Psalm 139 is all about David asking God, X-ray me, look me over, show me where things aren't right. Verse 23, it says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Know the areas I'm not trusting you with. Be ready to be challenged. 
David doesn't come to play church. He comes to meet with God. I'll tell you this. I'm a preacher's kid, okay? If anyone knows how to play church, if anyone knows how to do church, it's preacher's kids and elder's kids and deacon's kids. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. I know when service starts. I know when it's going to end. I knew the part of the service that I could duck out on that where my dad wouldn't see me. I knew the song we were going to play next. I knew when the preacher was starting. I knew when he was going to land the plane and be done. I knew when to raise one hand, two hands, or both hands a little bit. I knew church language. I know Christianese. I know all the hymns. I know all the new songs. I know what's going on. I knew church, but that doesn't mean I knew Jesus. Can we come raise the expectation level? Be ready to be challenged. Be ready to be looked at from the inside out. Search me, O God, as David said. Try me. Know me. Be ready to be challenged. Thirdly, be ready to focus. There are times throughout David's life where the wheels just seem to come off the tracks. But David always lifted his eyes and reset his focus. Psalm 121 says, I will lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I can, I can stay in the weeds. I can stay in all the stuff that bothers me. I can stay in all the people who, who drive me up a wall or make me angry. Uh-uh. Lift your eyes. Look to the horizon. Look to who your help comes from. Went fishing on the Atlantic Ocean one time after a hurricane. Don't suggest it. The waves were huge. Seasickness followed. And the guy on the boat, the captain of the boat says, stop looking at the waves, start looking at the horizon. That's where your stability is. That's where things level off. Know where your source is. Know where your hope comes from. Psalm 103 says to praise the Lord. And then David says, don't forget all the benefits of God. Reset your focus. Verse 3 of that chapter says, who forgives all of your sins and heals your diseases, who redeems you from life, from the pit, and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things. So your youth is renewed like the eagle. Refocus. And then finally, here's the last challenge. I'm going to challenge us to be ready to read. To be ready to read. Now, Psalms was written. There's a lot of them. There's 150 of them. But if we read two Psalms a day, one in the morning, one at night, we can read the whole book of Psalms, in the time of this series. Now, some of you would say, I'm not a re reader. Maybe you haven't been a, a Bible person. But one of our core missional uh, steps as a church is this idea of maturing, of growing. And in that comes discipline. As you leave this morning at the, in the back, there will be these cards that have a reading plan. One in the morning, one at night. Most of the Psalms, many of them are 10 to 15 verses. Honestly, you'll be done in about 45 seconds. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. There are some Psalms that are gargantuan, like the longest thing you read. You can't tweet it. <laughs> but I want to challenge you. Dive in. For those of you who struggle with depression or anxiety and don't know how to handle it, begin reading how David did because he struggled with it. For those of you who are maybe in a time of worship and you don't know what the expression looks like, Read Psalms and see what David had to say. For those of you saying, I know what I'm supposed to do, but the inward struggle pulls me to something else that'd make me happy, read what David said. Because David said, I'm not doing anything that doesn't honor or glorify God first. Ultimate goal. For those of you who are creatives, you're gonna love how David writes. It's, it's a lot of poetry and prose. A lot of big pictures. <laughs> not a pop-up book, big pictures, just... He, he writes with a big picture in mind. I want to challenge us to step up as a church and get into God's word together. Psalm 1, 1 through 3, it says, he calls us to meditate on God's word day and night. As you read, maybe something jumps out at you. And we did this last summer with the Proverbial Life series. Hashtag it. Put it on your social media and hashtag it. And what we found last year is that it was a great witness to others as far as understanding scripture, but it's also an encouragement to each other as we read through God's word together. Would you bow your heads with me, please? For some of you, this is a big next step. The idea of reading and, and getting into your Bible every day. And there are gonna be sometimes you read and you'll think that's nice and you'll be done. 
And there are other times you're going to read, and instead of you reading it, it's going to feel like it's reading you. Like, that's where I am. God's word does speak to us. Maybe you're here, and this is a bold step. There are some of you who read a psalm every day. That's awesome. I talked to one person last night. They read five psalms every day, like for their whole life. That's amazing. But if this is a bold step for you, kind of a first step, or if you're willing to say in your regular devotional time, you'll read along, and as a church... We'll continue in the book of Psalms. I'll jump in. I'll take the step of discipline. Would you just raise your hand up? I want to pray for you just for strength. Thank you. Thanks. Awesome. There's hands all over. Thank you. I'm just going to pray that, once again, that God's word reads us and speaks to us. Father, thank you for real life people like David. And may we remember that as you were with David through it all, you're with us through it all. You don't leave us or forsake us. As David wrote, even when we go through the valley of the shadow of death, you're with us and you comfort us. As he wrote later on, as he penned, even when I go through the, to the pit of Sheol, the belly of hell, you're with me and you don't leave me alone. Lord, I pray that as we jump into the book of Psalms, we can see and find life. I pray that it challenges us. I pray it stretches. I pray that we're able to refocus on who you have called us to be. And may we as a people and may we as a church be able to say, or you say of us, that we're a church after God's own heart. In Christ's name we pray, amen.